Good evening. Good evening, and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where I'm, I'm pleased to welcome to the program this evening uh, Mr. Seymour Durst. And Mr. Durst uh, will be well known to many here in New York City. He's been the uh, uh, finding light and direction of the Durst organization, a major real estate development uh, firm in New York City, and perhaps is best known, if I may, at the outset for calling attention to the uh, unconscionable growth of the, of the national debt is the one who is behind setting up the clock on 6th Avenue, which ticks off this national debt, which is known not only in New York, but all over the country and all over the world. And uh, Mr. Durst, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the program. This, um, this, this clock, this idea of calling attention, we, we want to talk about that right at the outset. You've been interested in the uh, fact that the, the national debt and the deficit has been growing at such alarming rates for a considerable period of time. It's about $400 billion a year It's amazing. Now, billion a day. Mm. And we've pointed out it's $13,000 a second. And the worst part of it is that interest on the national debt is now $292 billion, so more than half of all the federal personal income taxes goes to pay interest and cannot be used for all the social programs and education. And it's growing. The debt continues to grow. It's growing and the deficit. Ex extremely, extremely rapidly. And it becomes where I think someone has said that all of the income tax of the people that is paid west of the Mississippi of the Mississippi River, the income tax paid by those oh, about, people about more than goes half, to service the debt. Hmm? About more than half, not, not servicing, not reducing it, but just the interest on the debt. And they're uh, far from uh, beginning to, to pay it off. First, they must stop the growth, and there's no, no uh, uh, direction towards that. Yeah. And this has, been, this has been growing, I wonder from your perspective, or maybe we, we, we do want to zero in on this. We'll be talking a great deal about that. But I wonder from, from your perspective, if maybe we could talk a little bit about, about yourself, if we could. You've been, you're born and raised in New York City. You're a New Yorker and you've been here. I wonder if maybe we could go back and talk a little bit about your own background. And uh, then we'd, bring it, we'd want to bring it into this question of the of the, of the current fiscal situation of our economy nationally. But I wonder if maybe you could share a little bit for the viewers your own back. You were born in New York City and have been involved in uh, development projects here in, in New York over uh, uh, the, the, your, your career history. I wonder if you could share a little bit of your own background. I was born in the city, uh, I went to schools in the city and in the suburbs. Well, I went to college out in California. I came back to New York and worked at accounting for a while and then went into the family real estate business which was just trying to uh, survive and recover from the depression in the mid-30s. It was a terrible time, the Great Depression. And uh, I think that, that uh, what we call depression babies, people who uh, had experience in the depression, uh, went through the bad period of the 1980s uh, in better shape than people who didn't because they had the caution and, and uh, reason to realize that things can go down also. And that's one of the problems uh, that we have now in real estate and in the economy in general is that people lack that portion during the 1980s, and there was a huge overdevelopment of debt. So it's not just uh, the government that uh, is hurt so badly by excessive debt, but it, it also affected uh, real estate, particularly commercial real estate, where there was overborrowing. We now see some of the major corporations uh, reacting to their Overborrowing and misdirection. Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 problem is there. I wonder if I may regress a little. You said you went to California. Yes. To 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 college. Where where did you go? And what did you study? S Southern California. Oh yeah. Mm. Studied accounting. Uh huh. 
the reason was that so many people were unemployed, and I felt that uh, in accounting, you had the best chance of getting employment. As a matter of fact, I uh, worked at accounting offices during all the vacations while I was out there, and I got a job at a large accounting firm as, as soon as I came back to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, I recall, because at that time there was 25 percent unemployment, yeah. and people had been working all their lives. I remember I had an uncle who lived a couple of blocks away, and two o'clock in the afternoon I'd walk by his house and he'd be sitting on the front steps with his head in his hands, and a man who'd worked his entire life, and he had no chance of getting back into the economy. Mm -hmm. So that employment was very much uh, involved in people's thoughts. And coming out of that Great Depression, um, uh, economists and others and, and, and many responsible people have tried to understand because uh, have tried to understand the business cycle and have tried to understand what in the world caused the Great Depression of 1929 into the 30s and attempted to take measures then, Franklin Roosevelt and some of the things that were done, attempted to take measures that could um, create conditions that could assure that such a catastrophe would never happen again. There was a great deal of attention given to that. I think uh, a good part of that attention likely was uh, prolonging it hmm. because the ups and downs of the of the cycle probably goes according to human nature. Uh -huh. And where government gets into it and tries to overcome it, I don't think government has that influence. And probably what they did, is, what they do, uh, causes more harm than otherwise. And I keep reading about how uh, the Roosevelt administration turned things around, but actually, I came across a, a paper of uh, 1939, and at that time there was still 19 percent unemployment. Uh, this is seven years mm. after that administration. So I, I think it was prolonged by that because uh, there were 10 million people were unemployed, mm. which is higher unemployment then than now. And now the population is twice as big as it was then. So I think all those government uh, projects and, and the alphabetical projects uh, probably prolonged it uh, rather than uh, assisted it. And I think that's true today of government or involvement in the economy. Mm -hmm. The uh thing that really brought us out of that, many will say, the thing that really brought us out of the Great Depression of the 1930s was the activity that accompanied the Second World, Second War. Absolutely. The, mm. the uh, residential vacancies were huge, the commercial vacancies were huge, and during the war with what was going on, uh, everything tightened up. By 1943, they put on rent control in New York because the vacancies went down from 25 percent to less than zero in, in that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it was the war activity that did it, but I don't think that uh, government just by spending in peacetime uh, can duplicate what uh, the, the events of the war and the effect on the economy. They, we, we, there were a number of things that were done. The, the creation of the Securities Exchange Commission, you know, the enactment of Social Security. Well, certainly um, re regulations for, for social improvement is, is certainly a function of government. But where they try to become deeply involved in the economy and move the economy around through governmental actions, uh, I think that usually is detrimental. Mm -hmm. And all and these things, in a certain sense, as you say, 
exacerbated the conditions rather than uh, helping to to meet them. They, they, of course, have now been enacted, and we have this vast governmental organization of the, the economy and the assumption on the part of federal officials and others that uh, they have a response, the Federal Reserve Board, which well, has been that's, set up in that's 1934. That's regulatory, but yeah. I, I still don't think that government is that much uh, in a position to move the economy around. There's 100 million people uh, that are exchanging their services in the economy and their activities are supporting the 20 million people that work for government, but government involvement is primarily in education and in the military and in the police force and in, in welfare. Mm -hmm. and, and it is not involved in the economy to a, a large extent and it can't influence the economy. And it can't, it, it's those taxes that support the government are all coming out of that private sector business activity That's and right. we sometimes lose sight of that. And, and where the taxes are too high they hold back the movement of the economy. I think the, the worst uh, movement of government was occurred four or five years ago one thing Roosevelt did when he came in, the banks were closed, so he reopened them and he guaranteed uh, $10,000 of deposits in order to have people uh, leave their deposits in the bank. And apparently sometime that was increased to 20000 But four or five years ago, uh, there was a major uh, legislative movement and one House of Representatives, one, one House, wanted to increase it from 20,000 to 40,000. The other branch of the legislature was, was not uh, planning to increase it. But at 4 o'clock in the morning, somehow, they guaranteed $100,000 of deposits. And I think the result of that uh, is, is largely responsible uh, for economic problems today because the banks, without that risk, uh, attracted huge amounts of deposits. And then they had to find out what to do with it. So I noticed in, in real estate where it used to be that uh, you would value a property at $100,000 and the bank would say, well, it's really worth 80000 and we'll, we'll loan 60,000. Instead of that, you'd say 100,000, and the bank would say, no, I think it's worth 120,000, and we'll loan 150,000. Mm -hmm. And anybody with any sort of plan or idea, the bank would just flood them with money in order to get rid of these excessive deposits that they had. Knowing that they were going to be backed up by the government. If there were well, problems. They, they had the money and they, they had to lend it. They mm -hmm. had to do something with it. They were paying interest on it. So they mm -hmm. had to move it out. And, and uh, so much real estate was built that shouldn't have been built, but only built because uh, this excessive lending. It's the developer who was taking no risk because he didn't have to make an investment anymore. And it, it affected uh, the economy and the corporate world and the leverage buyouts. So I think that one governmental move of guaranteeing $100,000 of deposits, uh, that, that was the worst thing that happened in, in this decade. Well, do, do, do you feel that the FDIC and, the, and then the FS, you know, the, the system for the savings and loans, those systems of government guaranteeing the deposits, uh, the deposits of, uh, within, within the banking system that was enacted, was a good idea in and of itself to avoid runs on the bank and so forth that had been no, it characteristic. Was, it was a good of idea in, in 1933. Probably they should have withdrawn that $10,000 guarantee, but certainly there was no reason for the huge guarantee of 100,000. It's it's a question of, of uh, risk uh, versus mm. initiative and and risk. And, and return. And where there's no risk, uh, 
there's, there's no uh, control over, over investment. So that there was too much development and too much trading of, of corporate entities. Yeah, because of that, that situation. You can call it the entrepreneur, uh, you, 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 you believe in the entrepreneurial spirit and the need for there to be uh, a sense of enterprise that can manifest itself in the marketplace. That's what the marketplace is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, that's its entirely movement as against a system where the government runs the economy. You don't think, some people say, we look at the, the, the world economy that we're in now, um, we, have, we have in a certain sense among some people they see uh, a, a certain sort of adversarial relationship between the government and the private sector. Um, we see ourselves in competition with the Japanese situation, MITI, and the system that they have in Japan where they work in what is called an industrial policy together, and Japan in certain degrees has been highly successful in recent years in terms of entrepreneurial type advancement yeah, their stock of, market uh, average is less than half what it was three years ago, so uh -huh. they're not in such great shape. Not at the moment, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, all right. For five years it was 39,000 and now it's 16,000. Yes, sir. So it went I, down to 15, I think. So I wouldn't call that a, a great success. Uh, and perhaps something that would work in Japan uh, with, with their customs and culture would, would be different here. But here, here in our government, uh, I don't think our governmental system is, is uh, functioning properly or isn't organized properly because now as soon as someone is elected to the legislature, their sole interest is in re-election. Mm. And if their conscience and their personal judgment differs with uh, the re-election chances, then their, their judgment uh, and their conscience doesn't have a chance. And that's why I think the movement for one term is so important to uh, remove this whole idea of careerism uh, in the legislature. When the government was started way back, the feeling was that people who were successful and competent would move from what they were doing and go into government for a while and then go back to what they were doing. Now it's, it's all career and that controls every movement that's made and I think that is the problem uh, with, with government today. They're not using their judgment. And I think uh, this idea of term limitation to try to bring a halt to this careerism pressure, uh, one state passed it a year ago, uh, the state of Washington uh, rejected it. This year it was an, in the recent election, it was, came up in 14 states and all 14 voted for uh, term limitation. Mm -hmm. And this was despite great opposition for it. There was an organization that was pressing for it. And they said of the 14, they thought eight or nine would accept it. But some would not because uh, there was such lobbying against it. But actually, all 14 passed it, and some by very wide margins. So I think there's a growing realization of the misdirection, misorganization of our governmental system and the a movement towards term limitation. It would really take a, a constitutional amendment to bring it about, but certainly there are now 15 states that have uh, enacted laws as a result of popular votes. 
Yes, and this, this would reflect a sense on the part of a great number of people within the society. It became manifest in the last election of 1992 that there were vast numbers of people who felt a sense of, um, I don't want to know, alienation perhaps is too strong a term, but disconnectedness or a sense of being left out of the governmental process. The phenomena of uh, Mr. Ross Perot uh, finding great numbers of people who supported him. Earlier than that, there was an insurgency of, uh, within the Democratic Party of Jerry Brown, who had a great number of people who took this view that the government has been established with incumbency rates of 98% and these professional people. But there was a sense of being left out of that political process by a great number of American citizens. And uh, as they watched again, the debt growing and the deficit and these problems which weren't solved. Somebody, and it's still there, festering within the society. Somebody pointed out in the New York State Legislature that more in incumbents were indicted than were <laughs> defeated. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the, Sad. Pub, the public is, is uh, finally uh, becoming involved, which is not their custom because of, of uh, conditions. And that, that's really what it takes for uh, such public involvement. When we, when we uh, erected the debt clock, about three years ago, it was on Washington's birthday, mm. and I looked for a quotation that would be appropriate. And the first one I found was that Washington said that the great problem of the democratical system is that people don't feel until they see, and then they're moved to action. And uh, we are now reaching level where the public is, is feeling and seeing and uh, is trying to exert themselves and improve the direction of government. I see. They have to feel it before they begin to really react to the, uh, to the, to the appropriate government. Yeah, I think they're, they're, busy, beginning to they're busy with their own affairs. Yes, of course. Yeah. don't really become involved in, until it's hurting them. And it is hurting. Uh, we've always had people within our society who have been hurting. We have had uh, inequities within our society, as all societies have inequities and so forth. But it's now getting to be where there are great numbers of people who feel not only hurting, as you put it, uh, but one large reason for that being this uh, out of hand deficit and, and debt problem and so forth but it's hurting to the point where they are in, in, in not only, let's say, our least advantaged people, but also people within what had been our middle class and other kinds of people are feeling this, Much that there larger. are structural problems that have to be addressed and aren't being addressed by the day-to-day uh, the, the -day and uh, business-as-usual political debate and activity. It's a larger proportion of people are affected and, and they're realizing that uh, perhaps more than a democracy, we have a lobbyocracy in the legislative bodies. Lobbyocracy, that's an yeah, interesting are, term. Are a plutocratic lobbyocracy, do you are, think? Are reacting to the, to the lobbies. Uh, I just saw, came across a list of the uh, lobby representatives in Washington. Mm. It was just amazing. It, it covered a, a full page in, in fine print. And, and uh, they are the ones that, that uh, are controlling the government rather than the voters. Yeah. And you, uh, a lobby, I think that's a term that should be perhaps picked up. You've had a number of them. You use these quips very often. You have little things that you've, you've put, you've taken out little ads. And I wonder if I could show one here while we're talking about it. It was this ad, which just was in the January 25th, 1993 edition of the New York Times, quarter page ad. Let's see if we can't get the camera, give them a second to come in on that. But this is an ad that you took out. That's a considerable um, um, 
advertisement to take out. Well, actually, it was an advertisement of letters that I wrote to each congressman that was were delivered to each congressman, and mm -hmm. I tried to publicize it yeah. with the ad. And it, it showed that uh, the debt was now coming very close to the to the uh, federal debt limit. Uh, the, they call it the permanent debt limit, except they've changed it 50 times. Permanent. Uh, I, I mean to get a list of it and see, but it's just about 50. And the last time they increased it was up to 4 trillion, uh, about 200 billion. And it's about 60 billion below that. And it re usually increases about 35 billion a month. So in about two months, Congress is going to have to reenact it and probably go over five trillion for the debt limit. Amazing. And that means that interest will be absorbing that much more of all the federal income taxes. Uh, so the letter to the congressman stated that that. Uh, they have to increase the debt that they don't have a choice because uh, sometimes there have been some battles on increasing it where a few congressmen would hold back <coughs> while it and, and sort of blackmail uh, getting some of their favorite legislation introduced so that they can increase the debt limit because they stop all federal payments uh, when the when the close the close the market for uh, borrowing mm -hmm. but I, I uh, mm. have some other yeah uh, I call them academic discourses and some of them are uh, what we're talking about now it's on the government as the federal debt increases by a billion dollars a day we are witnessing the leverage buyout of the country with junk bonds. With junk bonds, yeah. Another one is politics. As against Democrats or Republicans, I support the monarchists. <laughs> when we had King George and taxation without representation, the tax rate was one and a quarter percent. Now we have representatives, but we cannot afford them. <laughs> and I'm not a fan of planners, and I say under history, We've gone from pilgrims to Puritans to planners. Architecture, building design fashions have undulated among Art Nouveau in the 1890s, Art Deco in the 1920s, Art Zero in the 1950s, and Art Pseudo in the 1980s. Art Pseudo. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to... Uh, Put down television, but under economics, <laughs> we've we've mechanized the farms, automated the factories, computerized the offices, containerized the shipping, and appliance the homes. Now we are TVing the mines. TVing the mine. Well, that's a, that's a true fact. The world lives by TV. We got a couple more of those. Legal the Gotham law. If something has not gone wrong, the city will see that it does. Hmm. Fashion. Men stopped wearing hats in the 1940s. Women stopped in the 1950s. In the 1960s, we stopped using our heads altogether. Oh. Huh? And perhaps uh, I'll state the last one. Well, central planning has been discarded in Romania, Soviet, and East Germany, now embraced only in Cuba, New York City, and Albania. The greatest, and this is a, what I feel is the need for balance between emotion and reason. Yes, sir, if you could. But that's, that's the greatest worldwide need is for balance between emotion and reason, between feeling and thinking, sentimentality and rationality. Emotion provides the motivation. Reason provides the direction, the power and the steering. One cannot steer with the accelerator. Without thoughtful direction, the most humane effort will lose its way. And I think that
That's mm -hmm. what is needed is this balance. And instead of a balance today, I think we're about 93% emotionalized in our thinking and direction. We're emotional. How, we're, we're emotional. Is this on a national scale you feel this way? International scale? World scale? Uh, uh, as far as the city of New York is concerned? Uh, or that certainly, certainly as far as the city of New York is concerned. Yeah. And I, I know some people, and I've said that they're guided 117% emotion and minus 17% reason. But uh, I think so much, we have such housing problems and we have so many minor uh, efforts that we make that makes the housing situation much worse in the building plans and the uh, environmental limits and there, there needs to be a, a uh, also a balance between uh, the The cost-benefit balance that's referred to uh, is the is the cost much greater, far greater than the benefit, and and some of the efforts that we need need and use in our regulations. Planning in, interferes uh, to, to such a great extent that. There's a terrible, terrible shortage of housing, which affects all sorts of things, the economic and social directions of the city, and yet they keep bringing obstructions to expanding the housing supply. Last year, there were 6,500 uh, new housing units built in the city. In the 1920s, uh, they built 90 and 100,000 units a year. And the housing in New York is, the median age is three times the age of the median age nationally, so that we're losing uh, housing very rapidly and have all sorts of obstacles towards uh, renewing it. <coughs> one, one of the, one of the principal well, we, we, we see the homelessness, see yeah. the, and we're influenced by uh, the emotional uh, effect of, of uh, seeing people on the street, but the shortage is actually about 600,000 people, according to uh, the State Housing Department. And there's 200,000 on the waiting list in the authority housing and more than half of their apartments, uh, families are illegally doubled up. And there's still 200,000 apartments in old law tenement buildings that were declared unfit for habitation in 1901. So the, the, this is the major housing problem. And uh, as I mentioned, there are all sorts of planning and various regulatory interference with overall housing development. And it's only, the government only gets involved in uh, areas that are, have heavy emotional impact. Well, emotional impact that we've, we, some people have said that uh, back again to this, uh, you know, let's say take the, back again to the days of the Great Depression where there were things that were being done or uh, how, what responsibility does the government have to uh, help establish a social order that is going to be able to address itself to the needs of the less advantaged people within the society? Well, Will the invisible very, uh, hand of the market serve all uh, best, in your view, or is there a role for no, we're, we're, public we're, education, we're, public uh, involvement, well, in public education, things, particularly for some of the have, less advantaged public? And we've had the government involved in housing for 50 years, it's uh, been accepted that where there's not uh, adequate housing, adequate supply of decent housing, government should be involved. Uh, having made that decision, 
they, for 50 years, they've been going in the wrong directions. And they say, who should we build it for? Uh, or you build affordable housing. And there's only eight or nine percent of the population that can afford the cost uh, and support of new housing so that you can't build affordable housing. We have these terms w w of affordable for whom, mm. but if you had, if there's an inadequate supply, mm. then people are going to be ill-housed and they're going to, and they're going to be, and they, and they will suffer. And the need is an adequate supply, so that the government's effort should be directed towards expanding the supply. Well, if, isn't there also a problem that you have a demand side? I mean, because if you, if you, if you have people that do not have adequate income in order to purchase that which the economy is capable of producing, and you have a shortage of consumer purchasing power of what can be produced by the appropriate utilization of human and capital instruments and so forth, isn't that also something that could lead to a misapplication or a, a lack or an under, under utilization or of, our, of our economic potential? You need a realization that the problem is shortage. And the solution is an adequate supply, is more production. Mm -hmm. If there's an adequate supply, uh, then low-income families would have, would have good housing. When they're, and, they, and they'd say, oh, the trickle-down theory doesn't work. But it's a move-up reality. If you have enough supply, whoever moves into one apartment moves out of another <coughs> one. Uh, the median rental of apartments is around $400 a month. That means that half the rentals are above and half are below. Uh, in, New, in the New York City area? In, in, in the York, metropolitan area? In New York City area. Mm -hmm. uh, why aren't they available for low-income families? And I've pointed out, and it's, this is one thing that's been quoted quite a bit, that uh, lots of low-income apartments are occupied by higher-income people. Mm -hmm. If you expand the supply, then the higher-income people would move up to the new apartments, and the low-income people would move into better apartments and out of their doubled-up situations and, and uh, out, out of the uh, welfare uh, armories and so forth. We, but if, I, if I may say, we have, a, we have a situation where we have a great numbers of people. They just published uh, a figure in the New York Times that published it, where between 1977 and 1989, during the rah-rah boom years of the, uh, of the economic growth, that the, the income gains during that period that something close to 70% of the gains of that period in income went to the upper 1% of the population in the economy. How, we have how vast... Do we, how do we get away from housing? Like those numbers uh, are, are different than what I read, but... but uh... oh, the, it was only that there, there, there were people at the lower end of the income scale lost money, and there are, num there are great numbers of people of some of, there are great numbers of people who are now fully employed. They'll work 40 hours a week and they still haven't got enough income from that in order to afford uh, to be above what they call the poverty line. There's even a group of people who work 40 hours a week and are homeless within, within our society. There's not enough income distribution to the people to purchase the things that the, the economy is capable of doing, but the income distribution problem is one, or don't you, you don't feel that that is a, a problem? Sure, sure it's, a, it's a major problem, yeah. but on housing, there's a solution. You have to build more housing so that low-income people can, can uh, be decently housed. And uh, uh, yeah. the, the uh, income levels are probably being evened out with, with higher income people that are losing their jobs. Uh, I, I noticed in the, some of the 
uh, of course, not-for-profit organizations uh, where they are, are more ethical than elsewhere and uh, their salaries uh, get as high as 400 and 500,000 so that mm. uh, the baseball players average about a million dollars. So it's, it's supply and demand. If there's an inadequate supply of, of top management people or, or baseball players or other athletes, uh, the salary gets very high. Yes, or even uh, in, in on the management. Other, on the other basis, you could have uh, government control at all. Uh, <coughs> And government could uh, uh, supervise the own and operate the means of, cons of production and distribution. And that means that you can't have a democratic government because it wouldn't be efficient enough. So then you could have the kind of governments that we just uh, got rid of and they, they prevented uh, so much income, perhaps, going to a few people. But uh, mm. with the result that 40 or 50 million people got killed around the world. Yeah, in the, in the sense of that, if you, if, you put, if, you put, if you don't have the market and you don't allow the, the free enterprise market to work its way and so forth, all power comes to be in the hands of the of the of the of the of the planners in, in and order the, to the be efficient and Politburo apparatchiks uh, and they have to have total control in a totalitarian government and then there's no control over their misuse of their authority you had you had one of your quotes in there saying that we've computerized the this industry and we've uh, computerized the office and we've robotized production yeah, and we've I, uh, I, done I all of these that things. That, that's the one where you TV'd the money. And then we TV'd the people at the end. We're TVing everything at the end. There's a certain uh, interesting fact that, or at least seeming tendency, that increasingly um, technology, what with computers and now robotics coming and other kinds of materials and so forth, that technology is increasingly responsible for production in a modern economy, particularly if we take the long well, oh. I think that's always been going on, and yeah, you see the changes. Yeah, but not like Tom Jefferson's day. There was very uh, little was, technology. Yeah, it was agriculture. Yeah, and it was more of in, a in labor. New, in New York City, you see the change in agriculture, and then shipping, and then railroading, yeah, think and, then, of the, and then manufacturing. Yeah. You know that manufacturing employment in New York City dropped from more than a million. Now it's under 300,000. Yeah. Since 1960. Right. And the planners decided, and this is government getting involved, they want to keep manufacturing and blue collar uh, work. So they uh, prohibited uh, anything that would interfere with manufacturing in about 20,000 acres, even though 10,000 acres were used where there was a million employment. It's dropped to 300,000 or less now. And despite all of this uh, man manufacturing zoning, uh, that not only didn't they expand the million, but it, it dropped to 300,000. So that uh, government can't influence that. So as I said, it went from agriculture to shipping to railroading to manufacturing to executive office centers and the office buildings. And we've lost most of that because uh, back a ways, a couple of decades, the fort of the Fortune 500 companies, 140 had the headquarters in New York City. Mm -hmm. And now it's under 40. Mm. Uh, some of that is because of the lack of housing and, of course, other reasons. Uh, in the last period of years, those office buildings have been occupied by uh, mostly consulting firms, uh, lawyers and accountants and advertising and yeah. so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's a question of uh, retaining that, that occupancy, because I think that 
supports about half the economy in the city. In the, in the city. And many of those manufacturing capabilities and those kind of uh, things historically, again, much of that has been lost, it would seem, to, uh, to the Pacific Basin countries which are emerging. Many of those countries, I, I wonder, I don't know how you feel about NAFTA, or the North American, you know, the, the arrangement so that there can be transfer of capital and equipment and so forth into Mexico and create a free trade zone and so forth. But the, the point I was trying to make is that it's increasingly technological instruments which are capital intensive in the overall productive process and the ownership of capital of the capital and the technology and capital in general within the economy is not very widely held. There are not very many people who gain income from a capital, um, from, from, the, from, from, from ownership of capital well, and I, they I rely be, only upon labor with the process that is becoming IBM increasingly. IBM was widely held but they weren't gaining income. No, that's from true. It because it's down about half. They just announced it, yeah. Yeah, that that is true. That is true. There's that we we're, we're we're having these uh they're having these these economic difficulties now. But I was just thinking of whether or not there wasn't uh the need for there to be just as there's an eco a political democracy if there is if we don't want to have a state run socialist system with uh, all the power in the hands of the government and so forth. If we don't need economic democracy and wider ownership of well, the technological the way, the way you do production. that is the government distributing it. Well, it could so be you're, done so by you're going, so you're going back to the other system. No, it, well, it, either, either either that or either it, it's one or the other. Either that or it could be that you could have. Uh, I mentioned to you a little earlier. They like Avis rent a car, and some other companies increasingly are financed in a way so that the employees are increasingly becoming owners of the corporation and brought in on the logic of business finance in order to build up an ownership stake in a, in a private property market economy to irrigate the economy and create the demand side to buy the things that the increasingly automated productive system of a private property market economy is able to produce. But again, to try and bring that demand side and allow, say, law in the name of the of the, in the language of the economists to, to, to operate. I mean, if they have the stock, then, then they'll be wealthy. Well, not if they have the stock, they'll be wealthy. They will be able to gain income by something only so than how their do labor. They, how do they get the income from? Well, they have um, by having eventually building up the same, putting available to the, uh, to the employees, instead of having the logic of business finance being where you make an investment that will pay for itself in a reasonable but period But the investment of time. is in stock. Mm. So that so that you feel that if you distribute if you give them stock that that will solve the problem. Well, if you give them ownership of plant and equipment. Well, isn't that in the stock? They're corporations. Yeah, and in the ownership is a, is stock. Yes, sir. Right. Right. You have stock which is imbo which embodies productive, technologically oriented, productive capability. And the people who own the, techno the, the stock or own the capital instruments in yeah, our the economy- The stockholders. Are the stock holding people within our society are relatively small in number. The very few, most people gain income for life's purposes by having a labor relationship or a job to a productive process that's increasingly becoming technological and its real means of of production, if you can follow. I, I don't know, maybe it's a, a side, you know, it's a... Are we still on? Yes, of course, yes, yeah. But that's just a, that's a, uh, you know, that's a, that's a, a question that... Uh, that's what they've been doing in the Eastern European countries is, is uh, privatizing by, by distributing uh, stock to, to the Employ employees, and that, that's their direction, and it's a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. Well, but in the meanwhile, we here in the United States trying to deal with this 
situation have this tremendous problem with the uh, the growing deficit. Are you at all are you at all sanguine that given this as you call it a lobbyocracy lobby lobbyocracy in terms of lobbyocracy, I would have said, and perhaps I'm wrong in this, but I, I would have said a plutocratic lobbyocracy representing special interests of very, very well uh, placed, uh, well financed special interests control the Congress. It takes tremendous amounts of money to continue in that congressional uh, ability to stay in the Congress and so forth, that it is the people that have a great deal of money to contribute to that, uh, but okay. they have this system that they're not going the to be The economy is based on investment, right? Yes, sir. And if people don't have investment, if, if these people that you want to spread around aren't, cre aren't contributing investment, and where's the investment going to come from? Mm, well, the investment's got to come from the. Uh, now, I agree. With it. You have to have the invest. You have to have the investment capability. So the stock represents the investment, and the investment is essential for <coughs> any any uh, economic activity. Yeah. What? Uh, okay. But in any case, we have this. Lo lo how did you say it again? Lobbyocracy. Lobbyocracy. I think you've coined a term that's going to be able to catch on. But are you sanguine that they're going to be able to uh, address this problem of the reduction of the, of the deficit uh, and the debt, or do you think that they will just take the easy course? Is there going to be enough political will to face I this problem? I think the best uh, direction there is, is uh, term limit, mm -hmm. so that uh, they're not influenced by the lobby. They're more influenced by their own judgment and, as I said, their own conscience instead of uh, focusing entirely on their career. And uh, we've done that. People say, oh, well, you won't have competent people, but we've done that for the presidency. And certainly you need more competency in the, in the presidency than uh, in any particular one of the 535 members of, of Congress. That is true, yeah. And, and uh, we don't fear limiting the president. Uh, I think I, I pointed out in, in uh, one of those mm -hmm. uh, if I can find it, I think I've got too many of them here. An environment I have, ideology sometimes creates an environmental balance. Anti-abortion ideology increases the population. Pro-gun ideology decreases the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is one that won't make me popular, it's, uh, but it's labeled humor. The 18th Constitutional Amendment was prohibition. The 20th Amendment was suffrage. Then they repealed the wrong one. No, that's not, that's a... But that's a joke. That's a joke, you're right. We have to have some levity introduce what you've done with a number of these quips. That you put on the bottom of the New York Times very often, and people yeah. will recognize it. You call that yeah, bottom I have, line? Yeah, I have about a hundred of those bottom lines. And one of them that got some attention, it said that Karl Marx's government didn't work in Moscow, and Marx Brothers' government doesn't work in New York. <laughs> so that was in the Times one Sunday morning, and the next day one of the papers uh, blew, blew those two or three lines up and commented on it. And I was on two radio programs that day. Mm -hmm. So it all resulted uh, from a three-line ad. Uh, those little things at the bottom of the yeah. first page in the New York Times, yeah. But I think that, that uh, the good part of our problems are the misdirections of government and and that exists to a greater extent in New York City than elsewhere, I think.
Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you really have taken a, a, an initiative with this, with this debt clock, calling attention to the, uh, the unconscionable growth of the deficit. It's a thing that the country is grappling with now. Attention has been paid to it. It has attracted a lot of attention. When, when it first went up, they, were, they sent me 400 clips. There was a press conference for that, and there were about 40 television strips. But we had no, no, uh, no public relations association with it. And some, some nights, it's on three different television programs, that, that clock. And uh, I think you, you, you may have mentioned that television crews have come from Japan and Germany. And, That's right. Uh, but it's on almost every night, and it, and it shows that people are interested in, in uh, those uh, overspending by government. And I think the, the solution has to be a cutback in spending. I don't think. Uh, a little taxation that's p politically uh, acceptable and, and economically acceptable, probably not at all. Uh, we'll do we'll, it. We'll, we'll do it. It, it. it takes a cutback in spending, and that's where you get back to the lobbyocracy. Yes, all right. Well, that's where it is. And I quite agree. He said in some of the pieces about that clock, there should be clocks, there should be one. In Washington, and somebody proposed they ought to put a little wristwatch that running that off and present it to each congressman or congressperson who, and every time it would click a million, it would click or something to give w notice of that. Some sort well, there of has been that. some legislation introduced uh, to erect one in Washington. Uh, and um, beyond that, some people are trying to put one up privately. And there's a truck driver who keeps calling me that if we put one on his truck, he'll drive it around the country. <laughs> okay, well, and, and I we park must. it park it in front of the Capitol and and uh, go through small towns. Well, it says a lot. It's there, right there in front of us all, and it's something that we all have to face. And I thank you really very much for having set that up and all your, your work. Is that you had sent that out back in 1979? The the thing you've called attention to that over a long time. It's out of hand. It's got to be controlled. And you've been helping and leading us toward trying to get an understanding of that so that collectively we might be able to address well, this problem. It's got to be corrected sooner or later. And the greater, the longer we wait, the greater will be the damage and the yes, suffering. Sir. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the debt clock and for coming in. And I'd remind you in the cable, it's been your pleasure, the perceptions in. Seymour uh, Durst, he's uh, organizer of this, uh, the Durst organization uh, uh, over the long period of his concern with the development of New York City and has uh, helped us all in understanding the problems of this tremendous deficit and debt that we do have. We appreciate uh, very much your coming in, Mr. Durst, and we would welcome, we would ask you and the cable audience to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for this particular segment. Once again, Mr. Durst, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. Good night. We'll see you next week.